For the last few weeks, our gathering together on Sunday has focused on what happens inside of these walls when we are together. And today as well, we want to focus on what happens when we are together and to talk about worship. Believers coming together for worship, it's a priority. Since the beginning of God's people, it has been gathering together for worship. In Acts 2, we read, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. In the breaking of bread, the praising of God, the fellowship that they enjoyed together, all those were part of the worship of God. But what is worship? What makes a worship service? Do you think of uh, maybe uh, robed priests and incense and candles and color and ceremony? Or maybe worship, you think of a, a quiet chapel and a, and a time of, of prayer, meditation. Or maybe you think of, even as we are having some today, preaching and communion and singing and praising and meditating and choirs. And, can worship be with a, a loud band and shouts and clapping and lights and hand waving? You know, all these things, you know, what really constitutes worship? Well, simply, worship is a response to God. It's a response to God. It is not about how we worship, but it's what worship really is. Worship is an active response to God in which we declare his worth. That God is worthy of our response. And it's not a, a passive response where we are uh, sitting and watching and listening and uh, enjoying what somebody else does. All throughout scripture, real worship is something that we participate in. There is, there's an action Maybe, maybe it's a decision that is made and not so much even a physical action at the time. But it's not passive and it's not a, a mood or a feeling. It is a response. It's a declaration that might be in words. It might be in, uh, in like I say, a decision or an action. But it's some sort of declaration that we make about God with our lives. God deserves a response from me a reaction, an action, something where I say, I know this is true about God, and it changes my life. He deserves my devotion, my, my love, my life, my trust, my obedience. All throughout Scripture, even in the Psalms, especially the Psalms, just think about the reasons that are given to give praise to God or worship to God. It, it's about um, who He is. Uh, that He is uh, the Redeemer. He's my rock. He's my shepherd. Uh, he's the Holy One. He's the Sovereign One. He's the Creator. Uh, he is omniscient. He is omnipresent. He, he is good. He is wise. And not only about the things that, that describe God, who He is, but also the things that He does shows how worthy he is. He rescued me. He, he judges. He guides me. He gives life. He keeps promises. He loves. And we go on and on and on. The reasons to say God is worthy of a response from me. That's what worship is. Worship is not the mumbling of prayers or the mouthing of songs that we have memorized because we have sung them for so many years. It's not the, the bits and pieces of a service all strung together to fill up an hour or an hour and a half because it's the things that we do every Sunday. Worship is the celebration, the celebration of God earnestly in prayer and intensely in song. It is giving to Him hilariously. It is serving him with integrity. 
Uh, it is the enjoyment and the participation in, in music to God's glory. It's everything, all these things and more, coming together, working together in a way toward a common goal where it is pointing to our response to God, what we're going to do, how we're going to react and respond and decide and to do because He is worthy of everything. Romans 12.1 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. You see, worship is not about the things we do when we're coming together inside of these walls. It's not restricted to a service, even though, yes, we are doing some worship here. But rather, it is what's been happening all week long. Worship is the calling of our lives that has been lived out all week long in a response to the worthiness of God, and we just happen to now come together, come together to declare and to share that, because all week long we've been doing it individually, scattered here, there, and everywhere. But now as a family, we come together to give God a praise, a response, a thanksgiving, a decision, something that he deserves. It starts with remembering what he has done. Uh, I'm going to ask Blaine Shipler to come up here. Um, some of you may know that Blaine is one of the new trustee candidates that tonight at the annual meeting we'll be voting on. Bruce Keister uh, was, uh, was also going to be up here today. He's a trustee candidate as well. But he's got bronchitis, so he's not going to be speaking today. And all I'm, what I want to do is I want to remember the mercy and the grace of God. I want Blaine to kind of draw our own thoughts to it personally by sharing personally how God brought him to faith. Okay, Blaine. Thank you, Phil. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as long as I can remember, I've had a relationship with the Lord. I grew up in the church, deep abiding faith in him and got baptized in my childhood church at the age of eight when I truly understood the significance and importance of it. And I continued to walk with the Lord, although at a very comfortable distance for me throughout my teens and college years. And then my senior year in college, God had grabbed a hold of me. One night, Sunday night, I was watching Bishop Long on Channel 20 back when there were about 10 channels in the world. And he was preaching from Ezekiel on dry bones. And I said, God, you must be talking about me here because I know you, and yet I'm not doing anything with my life. I didn't do anything about it at the time. And then a couple months later, in June of 1986, the most famous and infamous classmate of mine of college, Len Bias, died after an eye to bad decisions. And that really brought my mortality home. So a couple months later, when Mike Sprague invited me to a singles event here at church, I was ready, and I went met my future mother-in-law, so I, I know looking back, God had his hand on that. Um, and then 30 years, a beautiful wife, two wonderful kids later, here we are. Thank you, Blaine. Thank you. Remembering what God has done and then responding to it, that's worship. The response isn't something that can be contained in a service like we're having right now. It spills out and it flows in from life lived all week long. It's the presence of God in all those private moments throughout the week, but now brought together. It's a, a woman who is very conscious of the presence of, of God. In fact, overwhelmed by the presence of God as she's washing the dirty pots. And there's something, something has spoken to her heart by the Spirit, and she even just, tears start to flow from her eyes, and she says, oh God, I'm sorry. It's the husband who's changing dirty diapers, and he smiles and he says, oh God, thank you for this child. But I, I'm not sure I'm ready to be a father. I need your help. That's worship. 
knowing the very presence of God right there. It can happen alone in the car. It can happen around the campfire where you're, all your thoughts are, are directed to God. It can be walking in a busy crowd, but you're aware of the presence of God. And more than just aware of the presence of God, you're responding to Him. That's worship. See, the amazing thing is that God is actively seeking true worshipers. He really, really wants us to worship Him. He really does. And it's not a selfish kind of thing. It's a very real and natural thing because we came from him. We belong to him. Even more so because of faith in Jesus, we've been bought again and belong to him. See, worship is about him, not us. It's about what he gets from us because he's already given us everything. He doesn't need our worship as if he's incomplete without it. But he looks for it. He cares about it. And when we worship, we find ourselves in the center of his desires. Through the prophet Micah, and God told us something about worship. In Micah chapter 6, it's describing God uh, bringing a court case against the people of Judah because something has gone wrong in their relationship. A failure. And so it's like a divorce court. The question is, who's at fault here? And God starts off by saying, know this, I am not at fault in this relationship because I want you to remember all that I have done for you, how I have kept every promise, how I have brought you out of Egypt to this land and given you everything that you've needed. Never forget all that I have done for you. God says. So much, in fact, things that you weren't even aware of happening. Remember this. We need to remember this because worship is not about music selection or instruments or lighting effects. Worship is a right relationship. It's a right relationship, and not just with God, but with others. People challenged, in, in Micah's prophecy, the people challenged God's accusation. They defended themselves. They said, no, 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 look how faithful we have been in our worship to you. The problem is not on our side. We read here in Micah 6, verse 6, With what shall I come before the Lord then and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with Thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. They're saying, look, we bow, we bow low to you. Look at the many gifts that we brought. What do you want? More? Bigger? Look how obedient we are, how reverent, how generous we are. Isn't that enough? And in an exaggeration, they say, so what do you want? Us to sacrifice our firstborn to you? We think that we have done what God expects. Maybe if we're baptized and we join the church, we celebrate communion once a month. We read our Bible when we have an occasion to do it. We give a tithe to God each month. We follow the, the golden rule and treat others with a measure of kindness. <laughs> we do, at least as well as the guy next door. We sing the right songs in the right way, and we say, See, I worship you. What's the problem here? You say there's a problem in our relationship? I don't get it. I don't see it. See, we believe that when we come together to worship, what God really wants is our consistent uh, consistent things in worship where, where it's done in the right way and in the right way to, to bring us together in a worship and that he is comfortable with these things because we're comfortable with these things. Is, is an English style of worship better than a, a, a Spanish service, better than a, a Chinese style? Will a Methodist model please God while a Pentecostal style displeases him? Is the good old way we worshiped when we were kids the only way that makes God happy. We seem to have this sense that if we're happy, then God's happy. Is that true? 
Or have we misunderstood what pleases God? And thinking, well, what we just need is more of the good old, or for others, oh, the brand new is what we need in our worship. Aren't we really then just concerned about what pleases us and not God? Worship is right relationships. First with God and then with others because it is about our heart, not the style that we use. All throughout Scripture and, and the other prophets as well, God told us what he wants in worship. He said things like, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says, I desire obedience and not sacrifice. He says, I want you to trust me unconditionally. And, and Micah boiled it down. God spoke through Micah and boiled it down to just three things. This is what God said. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To act justly. That's relationship, friends. Relationship with other people. To act justly, a mutual respect, doing what is right, meeting the needs of those who are hurting and those who are desperate, it doesn't matter who they are. And then he says, love mercy. That's relationship again, a relationship with God and with other people. Really, this is describing a faithfulness, a faithfulness to your relationships. It, doesn't, it may be, in fact, a day where you don't come across anybody that has a need that needs to be met, but you have a loyal love. You love mercy. It's who you are, and deeply loving God and other people. So there's a faithfulness in your trust in God no matter what happens. Your obedience, no matter what the demand is, the obedience to God. And with other people, there's a kindness, a compassion, a patience, and a forgiveness because, hey, I'm faithful. That's the relationship I have. And then God says, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a commitment to follow God's will above my will or anybody else's. It's as we've said many times before, that blank sheet of paper. You've done it all week long before we come together for worship. Blank sheet of paper instead of writing out, oh God, these are the things that I want now. Will you sign off on it, please? Bless it. Rather, here's the blank piece. I've signed off on it. God, fill it in as you want. Here's my life. Use it. To walk humbly with your God. He says... That's what your Lord wants. He lays claim on every possible relationship, first to him and then everything else. The response to God, it's all about relationships. And worship together is unity. Since worship is about relationships, <laughs> then worship together involves how we relate together, how we treat each other. It's about unity. See, if anyone in this relationship of divorce court with God needs to change, it's always going to be us. <laughs> to change so that no matter who is preaching or who is singing or what is being sung or, or who is visiting, the simple fact is when we gather, we worship. And I'm able to do it, you say, because it's about my heart. Nothing else. Jesus was, of course, at least the people saw him, Jewish male, considered a rabbi. When he met a Samaritan woman who was considered uh, a loser by most people in town. You could not have put together two more different people. I mean, they were just the opposites. In fact, one of the things that the woman said to Jesus comes out and says it. We're, you and me, we're just different. Uh, in, in John 4, in verse 20, she says, Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. 
See, we're just too different. You're, you're talking about things that are fine for you, but not for me. You, you Jews, you worship in Jerusalem. That's where David chose. But we Samaritans worship at Mount Gerizim. And by the way, we only believe in the first five books of the scriptures. But apart from that, we have little in common. Well, Jesus brought it right back to the true need and to, to his identity, to the, if you want to say, the heart of the matter. <laughs> when he said, woman, everything is changing. He said to her, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The place doesn't matter, you see. It's all about the person. And the hour, the time has come when the person is going to be obvious to everyone. All throughout John's Gospel, the hour spoke of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. The time, he says, has come. It's now here where you know who the person of worship is and it's me, the way, the truth, and the life. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what style or background you come from. Your worship is going to be inadequate, just as all worship will be inadequate, Jews and Samaritans, doesn't matter who, until you realize that it is Jesus. Yes, we are as different as night and day. But because of me, Jesus says, everything has changed. We if by faith in, in, in me have a relationship with the Father, we together, we together are united in relationship with the invisible God who is spirit because we are joined to him in spirit as well and also in truth. And the truth is found in me, Jesus says. We are now family together. See, worship together is unity. And yet, let's be honest, what divides us when we come together is the art of worship. Not the heart, maybe, but the art. Art is difficult to grab onto. It's always changing with each generation. Art is also hard to do well. You know, some people people's art is just, they may think it's wonderful, and it really isn't. <laughs> but to do it well, it should reflect the worthiness of God. But you see, worship does not depend on the art, does it? Have you heard what God has been saying in his word? It is a matter of heart. It is a matter of relationships that are lived out all week long in response to the Father. It is not about the art of worship. When we come together though, we suddenly make it all about art. You say, I know worship is from the heart, it's not about me, it's about God. But I can't give him worship when things we do make me uncomfortable, when I don't know the words to the songs, when something is going on that's distracting me from the freedom to worship. I, do, I can't worship then. We may say, if only the place of worship were more beautiful, then I'd be able to really worship. Or we say, if only there was more a sense of awe and, and majesty and, uh, and, mere, and, and, and more reverence and the mystery of God, then I could worship. Oh, if only people were more relational, you say. Real, if I had a real sense of warmth and community here, then I could worship. Oh, if only the music were done better. Actually, you know, God demands the very best, and so if only the music were done better, then I could worship. Oh, if only the music were more contemporary, more, more now, then I could understand. Or if only if it were more familiar, like the old hymns, then I could really worship. 
Really? Are we unable to worship because our if only is not met? Now please don't misunderstand me. I'm not here to bash the art of worship. I believe from Scripture that it is very important. It's not, but it's not the most important. The heart is. We need to excel in our art, but it must not dominate or be the measure of worship. The heart is the measure. But God deserves our very best, not our leftovers, not a casual response to his worth. Oh, we'll put something together Sunday morning and see what comes out and hope the Holy Spirit shows up. (laughs) It needs to be our very best, but it must not create a disunity. And the disunity comes not from the art but in the heart. Art done well can enhance the heart worship. To to be able to see and to understand with all the parts of my brain, left, right, front, back, the whole thing, and with all the creative talents that God has given you and to me to reflect His creativity, that should be the beauty and the wonder of worship together which can't be done individually because I don't have all those creative abilities and you don't either. God is a God of beauty and detail and the more carefully that you look at creation itself, the more perfectly beautiful you see what he does. And then stand back and marvel, I bet he did the same thing in my salvation. So perfectly beautiful in detail. I want to give for you an example here. This is one of J.S. Bach's trio sonatas for organ. Musical excellence. One melody, one melody in the right hand, another melody in the left hand, a third melody on the pedals. Each could stand alone by themselves, but really they can't because it's put together in a way where you have all three interwoven, each maintaining its identity but added together, creating a beauty that far exceeds any one part. This was not done by accident, and it wasn't done just for musical beauty. Bach wrote this with an intent. He wanted to create a tonal picture of the Trinity. He did not worship because of the artistic expression. It was the worship of heart that led him to create an artistic expression. Which, when you hear it, and if you understand what's behind it, you say, wow. Maybe in a small way I can start to picture the wonder, the uncontainable beauty of the Trinity in a way that maybe I hadn't thought of before. That's how art can enhance the worship of heart. Here we come to the key point we need to see today. The fact of worship together, not individually, but worship together. This is it. It is not about me and God. It is about us and God. When we come together, it is now us and the Father. Like prayer, prayer can be done personally and should be between you and your Father in the closet where you're pouring out your individual private thanksgiving and prayers and requests to God. But together, prayer takes on a different understanding and meaning. 
a deeper and larger thing of deeper and larger issues. The things that affect all of us together and the things that will uh, impact all of us and come from all of us together, not individually, but together. In the same way, worship. I have my personal experiences and responses of worship many times in many ways all throughout the week where God makes himself aware to, to me and even in, in, in music that I listen to and, and, um, and things that I read, a response of worship comes from me. But I can guarantee you that some of you may listen or read some of the things that I would listen or read and you'd say, eh. But you see, that was my personal worship. But when we come together, it's no longer personal. It is us. It is corporate. And so something needs to change. I was introduced to an artist this week. <laughs> Makoto Fujimura. I was not attracted. This is one of the paintings of his. I was not attracted to his work at first. Um, it's different than I am familiar with. Uh, it was outside my comfort zone. See, I tend to like art that you understand right away. It prepares you, in fact, for a deeper message. But with abstract art, the fact is you often need the message first to prepare you to understand the work of art. But I was willing to look at it and to try to understand. Uh, the name of this work is Walking on Water, and I apologize that it in no way uh, pictures or represents the, the real painting, this image that you see on the screen. It was called Walking on Water. He painted it, Mako painted it, following the death of thousands from the 2011 tsunami in Japan. Uh, Mako is a believer in Jesus. So when he painted this, as a response to the loss of, huge loss of life, he also wanted to tie it to Jesus and Peter walking on the water. The devastation, the death, the fear that's all around us in this world. But there is one hope, Jesus. And so I said, I, I want to learn something here. I'm going to look at this painting. I want to see. And as I really stopped to look and to see, the passage of Scripture began to take on a whole new meaning. Because I... I felt, even as I looked at the painting on the right-hand side, I said, there's something there, but it's, it's, it's darkness, and I don't like that. I don't feel right. And I began to understand the terror, the loneliness of being on that sea and the waves hitting and thinking you were going to die. And then on the horizon, you see one spot of light, and it's at the same time that you are, are drawn to this, but also repelled by this otherworldly light I'm picturing it, I'm feeling it, I'm sensing it now from what the disciples must have had. It's a ghost, and they were terrified even more. But then they realized as it got closer, it was Jesus who got closer. And he is our only hope. And they were drawn to him at the same time, keeping their distance. I'm saying, wow, I feel it now too. Individually, this is still probably not a painting I would hang on my wall. But together with someone else who shares this with me, I suddenly have a whole new experience of worship and an understanding of this work. Because I chose to look and I wanted to understand and I expected to learn from my friend. That's how it is when we come together. You say, oh, but they're taking away our music. It's different and I don't like it. And I understand that. But you see, it's not being taken away. It's being added to. Together requires that we all put unity above our personal preferences. Personal preference is not wrong. It is to be cherished. It is, it, it is the language that God has spoken to your heart that has drawn you to him over and over many times throughout your life. Let it continue to speak. But it doesn't belong here as the ruling way. It needs to be here as a shared way of enjoyment. 
It is no longer my personal worship, it is our worship together. It is us showing the beauty together of our differences. You say, I'm not sure I like that, so I'm not going to come to the worship services anymore. Simple question for you. How can you do that and still declare the worthiness of God when the worthiness of God is a response of obedience? And Scripture says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hebrews 10. The worthiness of our God demands a response, a response of commitment to relationships that's shown when we come together in a unity that says, wow, look at all the different ways that God, that worship to God could be expressed from all the different hearts represented here. It's not just my heart, it's ours. Thank you.